Good morning, everybody. I'm Ari Plonsky, the deputy director of the Institute of Advanced Studies of this university, and also uh, one of the deputy coordinators of UBIAS. I will be your master of ceremonies for this morning. Uh, for the opening session, I am very pleased to invite Professor Silvio Canuto, our provost for research, representing the president of the university, Professor Vahan Agopian, uh, Professor Martin Kindrup, who is the coordinator of UBS Network, please, and Professor Paulo Saldiva, the director of the Institute of Advanced Studies, who is hosting this conference as by a decision of UBS Network. Uh, in the meantime, as uh, they are coming, I would like to uh, make a special welcome to Professor Sandra Nitrini, the director of the Institute of Brazilian Studies, and for Professor Carlos Roberto Brandão, the director of the Museum of Contemporary Art. Uh, other colleagues are here and will be presented later. And uh, uh, in spite of being presented later, I would like to make a special thank you in advance to Professor José Goldenbergi, former president of this university, who was the creator of the Institute of Advanced Studies during his tenure, and he'll address us uh, in the second part of the morning. Uh, for uh, the opening words, we are here, let me just mention, in the University Council room. This is the room where the key decisions of the university are taken. And we are very thankful to Professor Silvio Canuto on behalf of the administration for giving us this honor to open the fifth UBS conference at this room. So for his first remarks uh, of welcome and other remarks that he might find appropriate, I would like to invite Professor Silvio Canuto. Professor Silvio Canuto is a physicist from our Institute of Physics at this uh, campus. Uh, he uh, has uh, uh, very important contributions to his field of science and very recently, if I understand, uh, in 2018, he was admitted to the Third World Academy of Science, which is a very prestigious uh, international institution. Professor uh, Silvio Canuto uh, is uh, the provost for research, uh, I think less than one week, correct, Professor? Less than one week. So welcome. We wish you a wonderful, a very good uh, tenure. And uh, may I say that the Institute w works very closely with the provost office for research. Uh, we have several projects in common, and one of the projects that you know very well is the ICA. ICA-1, the first intercontinental academy, was only uh, possible from our side because uh, the provost for research before Professor uh, Silvio Canuto was very helpful, and uh, also the MOOC that will be shown on Thursday is a fruit of this partnership. Professor Silvio Canuto, please. Thank you, Ari. Thank you. So, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I have to start by saying that it's a great pleasure for me to share this opening session with Professor Paulo Sadiwa, my colleague from the University of Sao Paulo, and the chair, and Professor Morten Kindrup from the Aarhus University. And I understand he's also the director of the Aarhus Institute for Advanced Studies. <coughs> So I'd like to also to mention that the Institute for Advanced Studies at the University of Sao Paulo was initiated in 1986 during the rectorship of Professor Goldenberg here present. So I think we have to pay this tribute to him. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it's my understanding that this is the first time that this meeting takes place in the American continent. So I find it particularly appropriate the name that has been given or the lemma, which is the UBIAS, University-Based Institute for Advanced Studies, UBIAS in the New World, UBIAS in the New World. So, but let me please start by conveying on behalf of Professor Bahan Agopian, who is the rector of the University of Sao Paulo. So a warm welcome and the best wishes for a very successful meeting. 
as already stated by Professor Plonsky, I'm taking the duties and responsibilities of being the new Dean of Research, and that's a position that I occupy for less than a week, as he mentioned. In fact, I could also say less than five days. <laughs> So it's, in a sense, it's a real pleasure. I mean, it's, it's a great honor, in fact, that with only five days, I'm taking place in an opening session of such an important meeting. So I should also stress that I'm very pleased to be here today and to admit that we have several common programs with the University of Sao Paulo, the Institute for Advanced Studies, which is directed by Professor Saldiva and Professor Plonsky. So we are partners and it's our commitment to keep this partnership promoting sabbatical of selected faculty members to develop studies at the Institute of Advanced Studies and to keep promoting our common events. Some of them in combination also with the Sao Paulo Academy of Science and I have to acknowledge Professor Marcos Bucarich who is the president of the Academy of Science. So our office and the Institute for Advanced Study have many concerns in common. One is to promote interdisciplinary studies. So I find particularly interesting this series of events that we promote in common. And just to pick you one example, these are the strategic workshops that we develop in common and also with the Academy of Sao Paulo. So there are many examples that I could mention but perhaps I should stress just as an example, some trendy topics like uh, nanotechnology that has been discussed last year, but not only those, we have also topics like bioeconomy, ethics on research, and other more urgent situations and conditions and problems such as environmental sciences. As we all know, innovation today involves more than just one regular discipline. So the emerging problems including social demands, require the knowledge that's not bound to simply just one discipline. The present complexity of nature and society is not limited to the confines of just one discipline. And that's our, I would say, a world interest in disciplinary topics. Problems are getting more and more complex and may need cross-disciplinary approaches. I have a joke of my own, and that is to say that uh, I work with molecular systems. So I normally say that the electron does not know if you are a physicist or a chemist. The electrons are just the electrons, and they behave the way they want it. So it doesn't matter if you are a physicist or a chemist. So depending on the problem, you, you do need interdisciplinary and cross disciplines. We see physics in neuroscience. We see mathematical models in immunology and so many other examples. So some discussions are now timely, and one of them is related to the approach towards development of science. There was a recent article, I think last month, in the Nature, and that's the worldview of nature, one aspect, and that says that let's put the pH back into the PhD. So the reason I'm stressing the subject of interdisciplinarity is basically to value one importance of the Institute for Advanced Studies. There are other aspects that are equally important. So the Office for Research that I'm sharing now promotes research, of course, of all disciplines and attempts to anticipate new emerging problems and hence must take advantage of the intelligence that is established in the university. And in this regard, the Institute for Advanced Studies is a very important ally. I could see the program, just looking at the program of this conference, and I noticed that you discuss Intercontinental Academy and also the selection of the topic of the year. So let me close my brief words by saying that I'm looking forward to learning from you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Silvio Canuto. We really are very much uh, uh, looking forward to having uh, years of fruitful cooperation uh, with the office now headed by you. Uh, as I am an amateur ma master of ceremonies, 
I'm changing the original program that you have in front of you, but uh, give me this uh, opportunity of doing something uh, different. Uh, therefore, may I uh, please ask now Professor Paulo Saldiva to uh, address uh, our colleagues who came from so far away. Uh, uh, Professor Paulo already uh, made some welcome remarks yesterday evening at the Institute, but now is a formal opening of the conference. Uh, Professor Paulo, please. Good morning, everybody. I'd like to manifest my, my gratitude for, for, to all of you because of you came traveled for a long time. Distance, some people from Australia. I, I think it's the record. But uh, at least you, you, spent, you spent with us uh, four or five days, and I hope that this could be very useful and also relaxing and with joy. This is important. I'd like to thank you Thanks to Canuto, representing our rector, Professor Goldenberg, who was the creator of our institute, you for allowing us to host you in, in our, you, our institution. Uh, the world is quite complex and it's very complicated. We artificially separate the different domains of knowledge in order to have a better glimpse to, of some areas important to the benefit of mankind. Uh, but how we manage to get at least a slight understanding, a crosstalk between disciplines, this is absolutely necessary. Let me, let me simplify the model and approaching the basic question, a situation of distress of a person that gets sick. When an uh, individual with a given disease approaches to his physician, he is asking for a third opinion. The first opinion was Dr. Google, the second opinion Dr. Yahoo, and then he needs uh, a third opinion with a physician. So he looks for the best science available, now uh, possible to be apprehended uh, using uh, very simple touch of a screen. The second step, uh, the, the patient also makes some philosophy. He wants to explain how this given disease occurred to him at this moment of his or her life, or what happened, why this happened to my son, or for those people, those people that I love. And at the moment that the, the despair or the, so if science and philosophy didn't manage to get him or her more relaxed, he goes to a church or any temple. So Descartes didn't kill God, just changed the address. Uh, when you have a scientist explaining a miraculous cure for, a can for the cancer using a, a white coat, like an angel. Depending on the logo of the university is an archangel or a very high-ranked uh, mystical entity, but it, him or her is present themselves in a quite complicated language. Your disease will be eradicated because we develop a miraculous drug that impedes the phosphorylation of second messenger of a given 
protein. And this will promote apoptosis through some pattern, uh, some molecule that gets out of your mitochondria. So this is incomprehensible. As the uh, scriptures and the Bible or any mythical, uh, mystical book occurs, uh, is, is expressed. So this is uh, the divinity of science. And uh, so in order to provide the benefit for humankind, we need to understand at least the need of science, the need for an explanation, a logical explanation, also deal with the spiritual values and principles of a person, of nations or problems. I think this is the reason for the, uh, the existence of Institute of Advanced Stu Studies. You walk it, uh, uh, perhaps have a glimpse of our university spread out in a large area. And if a philosopher wants to take, talk with a biologist or a, or a chemist, if he has to take his car, turn on a key, interaction is not possible. And uh, global problems need international views and approaches. So I think this is the mission of the Institute of Advanced Studies and the principal reason that we are meeting together to provide global solutions for that encompasses the interests of different countries, different cultures, different values. And by understanding the disciplines, it's probable that we can understand people and perhaps we can provide peace. Understanding of the diversity, able to, to catch the meaning uh, of different areas of knowledge, perhaps it's a good way to understand the meaning of different cultures and different countries. So I, I am very happy to have such experience. Being part of an institute of advanced studies is for me, it was for me, and is being for me, the most pleasant experience I have in my time. I would, and I, I was exposed to multidisciplinary research very late. So I was already, my connections there, my neuronal connections were not so rapid or intense, but even in this situation, I was able to admire the beauty of addressing complex problems with the appropriate complexity. Again, thank you. I hope we, ha we have a, a very nice period discussing, uh, creating and making a very nice multidisciplinary dish or plate or a recipe, not as a Japanese cuisine that you put everything in the plate and you, but people think did that mix, you know exactly what you are eating. But I would go to French cuisine that you eat and you are not, don't, are not able, able to recognize what you are eating. It's a different thing. It's a, a different solution. It's a combination. It's a fusion like bacteria do. do. Uh, I think this is the art of complexity. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much, Professor Paulo Saldiva, for uh, giving us uh, inspiring, uh, uh, this inspiring words. And uh, on a personal note, may I say that as you are so happy to work at the Institute, uh, I'm also, and working with you makes it special. Uh, we have now the pleasure of receiving uh, Professor, uh, Professor Martin Kindrup from University of Aarhus. Uh, the director of the Aarhus Institute of Advanced Studies, who is the coordinator of the network and uh, 
on behalf of uh, the university, the institute, uh, thank you for uh, having uh, this, uh, making this effort of bringing everybody here. Thank you, thank you, Ari. It is an honor for me and a great pleasure to welcome you all on behalf of UBS here in Sao Paulo. And let me add a warm thanks to IEA Sao Paulo for hosting us. UBS was founded, as you know, in 2010 in Freiburg and was an initiative from Fries Freiburg. Since then, there's been a series of meetings and conferences, New Delhi, Jerusalem, Vancouver, Nagoya, and the last regular directors' meetings have been those in 2014 in Taipei, Taiwan, 2016 in Birmingham, England, and now 2018, Sao Paulo, Brazil. And it's the first time the directors' conference is taking place in the so-called New World, and hence the title, as you mentioned. Today, UBS has 39 members, and at this conference, five further institutes have, after applications, been invited to present themselves in order to obtain membership. But at least half a dozen other institutes are represented here, institutes in the making, guest members, and others interested in the network and our work. A good question to ask at an occasion like this is, of course, why UBS? Why such a network? In my opinion, this question should be answered at various levels. One is, of course, about general exchange of experiences among institutes of advanced study. The majority of this world's institutes are relatively young, an exchange of all kinds of procedures, best practices, is extremely useful. I have personally stolen many good ideas from colleague institutes in the development of our institute, IS Denmark. We can learn from each other's, for instance, procedures for selection, each other's infrastructure, that is, how many mandatory versus offered activities for fellows should there be, from each other's governance structures, from each other's administrative organization, and for instance, our experiences with evaluations of institutes. We are actually going through an international evaluation this year, and I'll be happy to share our experiences once it has been finished. But besides these general subjects, we secondly also have some specific reasons for sharing in our capacity of exactly university-based institutes. We all have a mother university, or father, okay, feel free, and we all have at least potentially a delicate relationship to that mother university for obvious structural reasons. Since we are supposed to be outside the ordinary university structure, possessing an amount of rel relative autonomy, a certain ambivalence between dependence and independence is unavoidable. Our usefulness for our universities is part of an ongoing agenda. What are we good for? Such questions are often asked based on a day-to-day -day logic, ignoring the fact that results of institutes like ours mostly are to be accountable and visible on a long-term basis. And the same fact of incongruity makes us vulnerable, especially concerning funding. Whenever hard times economically are over us, we are subject to potential economical threats from our universities. We all know many frightening examples of this. Now these conditions, of course, changes from time to time, 
from university to university, from institute to institute. But we do share these problems and to exchange our experiences makes very good sense. Finally, a third field of joint interest is, of course, the questions about the very concept of institutes for advanced study. The building up, the strengthening, the developing of the concept. But why so? Why is the concept as such interesting? Well, obviously, the concept historically is connected with prestige, with symbolic value, with high status. This high status is important, yes, imperative for our endeavors to attract the best scholars. We are thus all obliged to accept and to respect the concept, without which we may degenerate into just a sign on the wall. And we all know examples of institutes like that, nice signs on the wall and next to nothing behind the sign. But of course, handling the concept represents a real dilemma, also for a network like UBS. How can you negotiate the wish for, on the one hand, being inclusive, welcoming everybody, and on the other hand, maintaining certain standards in respect of the concept? Our practical solution in UBS has been different levels of membership, combined with a policy of inviting everybody interested to the meetings and to the talks while maintaining certain criteria for full membership and thus establishing, a, one could say, closed but still completely open club. But that, of course, doesn't solve the problem of where to draw the line, how to define and develop the concept of an institute for advanced study in general and a university-based institute for advanced study in particular. I guess everybody can see the Scylla and Charybdis between, on the one hand, a totally broad concept of institutes for advanced study, leading to a watering down of the concept making it possible for all universities to have their own institute for advanced study without really making the effort of creating one. That would lead to a process where institute for advanced studies eventually lost their distinct symbolic value and thus their attractivity. On the other hand, a too closed, too exclusive concept might block up the access for new initiatives, to profit from the learning processes and the international interchange of experience among the institutes. And eventually, the phenomenon of institutes for advanced study thus might die in anemic exclusivity. So, somewhere in between. However, I do not personally believe in one model or recipe for institutes for advanced study. This can be done in different ways, all at the end of the day respecting the principle of institutes for advanced study as a kind of loyal opposition to academia within academia. This is Dr. William Kohl's expression, and I heard it last week. A loyal opposition within, to academia within academia, making it possible to offer the best conditions for genuine researcher-driven research. Researcher-driven research, isn't that just a pleonasm? No, unfortunately, it isn't in the ordinary university systems of today. Researcher-driven research. I hope this conference and our discussions will contribute to further developing and defining this balance between too loose and too narrow definitions of our work, between letting everybody in and ruling everybody out. And I hope, of course, that UBS as a network 
during this conference will grow even better and stronger as a joint platform for developing our institutes in the future. So, on behalf of UBS, once again, thank you, Sao Paulo, and welcome to Sao Paulo to this director's conference. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Morton, for first your leadership in UBS and second for these words which uh, reflect, I would say, uh, going also with what Professor Silvio Nuto mentioned, especially Professor Saljiva, the complexity of our uh, particular part of the world. I would say the, what came to my mind is fuzziness. It's not in or out. You are in and out at the same time and how you find this equilibrium. So thank you very much. The opening session will continue, so uh, it's still the opening session, but I believe uh, it would be more appropriate if Professor Kanutu, Professor Morton, and Professor Saujiva would sit down because we'll have now a musical experience. Uh, we thought uh, it's a tradition here in this university to have some musical experience at the beginning of an event, and we thought, what should we do? We obviously can bring... Uh, classical music, which is uh, something that uh, we all uh, uh, appreciate, but we're going to be on Thursday evening in Sala São Paulo and we'll have this uh, pleasure uh, already uh, scheduled. Uh, the other option would be presenting Brazilian typical music, but uh, we thought uh, we should do something, that's also very common in international conference, but we thought we should do something advanced, something different. And uh, in the programs that Professor Silvio Canuto mentioned, the sabbatical, we had the very interesting opportunity of having with us Professor Dr. Rodolfo Nogueira Coelho de Souza. Professor Rodolfo, who is already standing, he uh, uh, is uh, uh, graduate, he graduated in 1976 in engineering in the Polytechnic School, so we are colleagues. Uh, I am a few months older, to say the least many, many months older. And, but Professor Rodolfo uh, is uh, uh, really a professor, not in engineering, but is a professor in the uh, uh, campus of Ribeirão Preto in the School of Music, in the area of music, in the philosophy school there in the area of music. And his proposal for this period that he was at the Institute was to compose an opera, which has uh, 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 very interesting names that maybe he'll provide some hints, brief hints about. Invention of an opera, a Pascal machine in Pernagua. It is a research in experimental art and innovation in soundology, if I have a more or less a translation. So we thought, uh, again, uh, let's share uh, one so interesting experience of somebody from engineering, but uh, doing uh, really advanced uh, research and uh, uh, developing something in the area of music. And so we invited Professor Rodolfo, who came from Ribeirão Preto, and uh, brought also a, a colleague with him that will uh, also be with us, Liliana uh, Sulpicio. Uh, and uh, he obviously won't have time to present the opera, so he'll present some other compositions that he did together with flautist uh, 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 that also was so nice to accept our invitation. And uh, please, uh, Professor Rodolfo, it's your turn. Explain what you have been doing, what we are going to hear. Okay, uh, I will speak very briefly. Um, I will not repeat all the information he already gave to us. Uh, it's important to realize that this uh, research grant allowed me to have contact uh, with interdisciplinary uh, thought. And uh, the result of this research is also a consequence of uh, this contact with biologists, uh, mathematicians, engineers that was part of this sabbatical program. Um, and um, they inspired me to do this research. This research uh, was intended to be used in the opera, 
but uh, later was used also to other compositions like the one, the two of, that we will uh, listen today. Um, of course, it's not traditional music, it's experimental, very experimental music. You can relate it to this uh, music, thinking that it could be used in some tracks of movies. The first one, uh, called Salamandra, um, uh, deals with this lizard, Salamandra. Uh, and you can think that maybe I could uh, have composed it for the shape of water that has a fish Salamandra as the main character. Uh, the second piece uh, in is for flute, Cassium. Uh, my colleague will play the flute. I will play the electronics. The second piece um, uh, relates to birds. Um, every sound there is made um, from the transformation of percussion sounds, resulting in biological, uh, or biological inspired sounds like birds. And you can think maybe it could be used as a soundtrack for Hitchcock's Birds, uh, the movie, uh, classical movie. Uh, I hope you enjoy or at least be challenged to listen to complexity as a way of expanding our, of our thinking about the world and the music.
Thank you very much to Professor Rodolfo and his beautiful team for expanding uh, interdisciplinarity and bring it, it not only the, the, in our brain but also in our senses. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, we are exactly on time. We'll have now a 15 minutes break for a coffee just outside this room and in 15 minutes I would uh, very much uh, request your return and we'll come to the second part of the morning which uh, will be uh, opened by Professor José Goldenberg. Well, after a, a very, I think, uh, interesting opening session that touched uh, our brains but also our lives and uh, senses, we'll go to the second part of this first morning. And the second part uh, was thought as, having, uh, as, as giving you an opportunity to enter a bit in our institute as you are going to be with us for uh, the rest of this week. Uh, and uh, we call this session uh, Institute of Advanced Studies USP, an environment of dialogue between sciences and with society and uh, we'll have uh, the following uh, session. Uh, we, firstly, uh, we'll have Professor José Goldenbergi. Professor José Goldenbergi was already recognized. He was the president of the university, or the rector, as we call it here. Uh, 
when the institute was created, it was his uh, drive that created the institute. Then we'll have Professor Paulo Saljiva as the current director of the institute. And then we'll have a short testimonies. Uh, apart from the musical testimonies that we heard already, uh, that uh, will provide you uh, some glimpse of how it is to be part of the time during a certain period as a fellow with different names. We use different names for, for fellows. Uh, as it, as the, what is the experience uh, mentioned by, or ex exposed by the people themselves of the colleagues themselves, of, of the experience in our institute. So, uh, may I uh, begin by asking kindly Professor José Godenbergi to address us the first uh, part of this session, and then I'll call the other colleagues. Professor José Godenbergi uh, is a physicist by training. Uh, he has a long and fruitful career not only in the university, where he continues to be very active. Recently, the university completed 80 years, and Professor Goldenberg was commissioned to try to provide uh, an image of a, a complex body as our university uh, for the 80 years. Uh, Professor Goldenberg was very active in public service. Uh, he was the Minister of Education, uh, Secretary of the President for Science and Technology, uh, Secretary of the President for Environment, State Secretary of Environment, among other positions. Uh, currently, he is the President of the State of Sao Paulo Foundation for the Support of Research, the FAPESPI, which is a very uh, beautiful and uh, important organization in our uh, science, technology, and innovation ecosystem. Uh, Professor Godenbergi is uh, internationally known in the area of energy, uh, has been uh, involved in many ways uh, in this uh, topic. So, uh, but I, I would say, Professor Godenberg, that what we admire most is, if I may say so, that uh, you have accumulated so, so much use, so much use along these years, Professor Godenbergi is Almost 90 years, correct? Chegando nos 90, quantos anos? Almost 90 years, but is as young and bright and energetic as a youngster. Professor Goldenberg, thank you so much. Professor Plonsky asked me to uh, respond to two questions. The first one is why the uh, Institute for Advanced Studies of the University of Sao Paulo was created and what for? And uh, I did that in the beginning of my uh, uh, position as rector of the University of Sao Paulo in 1986. And uh, to respond to these questions, I have to take uh, a few minutes to explain what is the University of São Paulo and what's the role of an important university in a developing country. Uh, as you know, Brazil has approximately 200 million people. It's a uh, developing country, which is a highly developing country. It's not uh, a backward uh, developing country. And uh, although the Portuguese which uh, colonized Brazil since 1500 were very tough colonizers. You know, there are comparisons in history books between the role of the British in India and the Portuguese in Brazil, and uh, apparently the Portuguese were much tougher. Uh, you know, printing presses were forbidden in Brazil uh, until the uh, 19th century in Brazil. So it was a tough country. Uh, however, uh, over the years, in the 19th century, it was evident that one needed technical schools. And uh, it was impossible, therefore, for the running elites at that time, for the, for the aristocracy, not to establish 
schools that would serve the economic development of, that, of the country. A very symptomatic development of that kind is that the first uh, higher education school established in Brazil was a law school uh, because uh, questions about land ownership were the main problem of the uh, people of that time. Then, uh, in the middle of the 19th century, military schools were established and engineering schools were only established at the end of the 19th century. And uh, the university as such, uh, and the University of Sao Paulo is the first university established in Brazil, it happened in 1934, approximately 80 years ago. And uh, it was established uh, by putting together a number of uh, schools that existed, medical school, pharmacy, and so on and so forth, plus uh, ideas that were enlightened at that time. The ideas were the, basically, the idea that the university is not a agglomeration of schools, but it's a place where people worry about uh, new developments and uh, research and understanding of what's going on in the world. Now that was 1934. It was uh, a rather recent development. Uh, the University of Sao Paulo was very well endowed by, by the government of Sao Paulo. Sao Paulo state is a rich state. You know, of course, when you look at the average GDP of Brazil, it's quite low, but if you take the state of Sao Paulo separately, it's a rather developed state. And the University of Sao Paulo gets 5% of the taxes of the state of Sao Paulo, which is a very interesting and original uh, situation. I mean, there is really no negotiation involved between the university and the government, as it is the case in many other, other countries. We get approximately 5% of the taxes regardless of what happened. And uh, in the period in which I was director, from 1986 to 1990, we received from the government not only that amount of money, but we received a mandate to use the money as we saw fit and the University Council, which sits in this room, decides every year where they want to put the money. If they want to buy uh, automobiles for the directors, or if they want to establish a department of Oriental philosophy or whatever. And the University is independent to that extent. So it was really uh, a very interesting development. Now, uh, the point is following, is that as you look at the campus of the University of Sao Paulo, this is not the only campus of the University of Sao Paulo, but it's the largest. When you look at the campus of the University of Sao Paulo, you realize immediately that the geography of this campus is organized against integration. You know, you have to walk two or three miles to find your colleagues. And it's, it's an idea that uh, originated many, many years ago, and it was a pretty bad idea. But it starts it is in the DNA of the university. So, as you see, the sector of chemistry is up in the hill. The uh, sector that deals with uh, medicine is somewhere else, and so forth. And you never meet people except the people that work in the same department that you work. That was the situation in 1986. It was an absolute lack of integrity. There are, of course, historical reasons for that. Yeah, there are, these reasons exist in your own universities. You know, because the, uh, the 20th century uh, was a century in which the departments of chemistry developed tremendously because of the First World War which was the war in which explosives were used in large quantity, regular uh, explosives. Now, in the Second World War, 
uh, nuclear weapons were developed, uh, as, as well as radar and other instruments, by physicists. So these departments were, became very, very important, and they became worlds in themselves. There was no, almost no communication between these departments. So as, as, as soon as I became rector of the University of Sao Paulo, I realized that it was very difficult to talk to people. The only way to talk to people was to summon, to summon them uh, uh, to my office. You know, and there was an important visitor, uh, which was usual in Sao Paulo. There was no place for these uh, important visitors to talk. For example, we had the visit, the visit at one time of Professor Galbraith in the United States. And I invited him uh, to give a talk at the University Council. It was not this room, it was the, the room where the Institute for Advanced Study is now. But uh, that's what I had to do, because it was the only way in which I could get people to listen to a person that was not a physicist, a chemist, or a medical doctor, or a psychologist, and, and so on and so forth. And uh, I realized immediately that the way the university had developed until then was along these classical lines of lack of integration. Uh, in, in my personal uh, career, I had uh, gone through experiences of that type because I was an academic, purely academic physicist for more than 20 years, and I did work at Stanford and Princeton. And I was always impressed by the Hoover Tower at Stanford and the Institute for Advanced Studies in, uh, in, uh, in Princeton, in which people, some people, few people, were excluded from the day-to-day -day activities and were able to work on their research. And uh, one thing I did as rector was one of the first things I did actually was to set up a system by which every professor, junior or senior, had to lecture eight hours a week. No exceptions uh, accepted, you know, no exemptions accepted. Because a system developed at the University of Sao Paulo at that time, in which everyone wanted only to teach graduate courses, you know, because then they could choose the discipline and choose the students. And undergraduate studies were not considered a very noble activity in the University of Sao Paulo. So teaching, undergraduate teaching, was important. It is important today. That remained. This was many years ago, but it remained. But uh, what I thought was needed was a place in which you could uh, sort of uh, uh, isolate people. Not isolate, but find a place for people in which they could be freed from teaching undergraduate, undergraduate activities, or they could teach they wanted, but they were not forced to teach, and reflect on activities of different kinds. So my, my idea in establishing the Institute for Advanced Study was sort of geared to senior people, some of them retired, some of them not retired, but people that had careers, important careers in some specific area, but where they could meet with people from other areas of activity in which they could exchange ideas and enlarge their views. So a typical exercise was to write a book, you know, free from other compromises at the university. And visitors, of course, which I thought was very important because they would bring new views into the university. The, generally speaking, not only at the level of graduate students, but at the level of education in general and university, uh, universities in Brazil, what I consider important is that, and this is why the University of Sao Paulo has international activities of many kinds, and FAPESP, the Foundation for the Support of Science in Sao Paulo, supports uh, the universities to a very large extent, is to expose local people, Brazilians, 
to the developments going on in the world. Not only technology, but only in political science and other areas. In order that the people running the activities in the country can pick up the best ideas that are applicable to what for the development in Brazil. That's irrational for the support of research. We do put a lot of money into research, not because we have, uh, we are sort of uh, naive to the point of believing that we can do better uh, in artificial photosynthesis than Harvard can do. No, we, we are not naive to that point. But we want to understand what they are doing because it might be extremely relevant for the preservation and utilization of forests in Brazil. That's the rationale for the support of science and technology. And, uh, and, and uh, the Institute for Advanced Study has an important role in doing that. And indeed, uh, the first director that I appointed for the Institute for Advanced Studies was an historian, which is, I think, typical of the choices I was able to make. Because I thought a man with a historical perspective, you know, could uh, play an important role. It was the professor of history, Carlos Guilherme Mota, which I think did an interesting job in attracting big names. Uh, the big names are not attracted because they were in the, in the in Facebook and so on, but because they had written important books and we wanted to expose local people to uh, these ideas. Uh, before uh, being appointed rector of the, uh, of the University of Sao Paulo, I was very involved in the mid-70s, uh, beginning of, of the 80s, uh, in important discussions about public policy in Brazil. Because there was a tremendous discussion here in 1975, 1980, at that time, under a military government, of uh, the idea of Brazil uh, developing nuclear weapons. It was a development at that time which is very similar to the development of Iran these days, you know, and North Korea, you know, because the military thought that the possession of nuclear weapons would be an important vector for the development of the country. And uh, technically that's incorrect. Brazil had plenty of hydroelectric resources, so the production of electricity could be made by other sources and not by nuclear energy. And th there was a discussion about wh why, what was the need for Brazil to engage in a huge nuclear program. And uh, that's a problem of public policy. And I learned about public policy. And then later on, when I worked in the government, uh, as Professor Plonsky mentioned, at the state government and the federal government, I really understood what policy making is, you know. I mean, you make a, a wrong decision, you know, and billions of dollars are spent in the wrong direction. You, know, you make the right, the right, the right decision, and you don't spend any money, and you, you can, or very little money, and you, you can achieve your end. So public policy is very, very important, and I thought always, responding to the second part of the question, is that the work of the Institute for Advanced Study, which mixes uh, people from different uh, areas, could be an important uh, place for the formulation of public policies. And uh, I insisted right from the beginning that the Institute uh, was to be completely independent. Uh, the choice of visitors was the responsibility of the Institute. And there was an episode which was very interesting, which I'm going to relate to you because it's little known, and I think it, it has the, I think it has something to do with the spirit of the Institute for Advanced Study of the University of Sao Paulo. Uh, at the end of my period as rector, the idea of Brazil uh, producing nuclear weapons was uh, abandoned, practically abandoned, and the person that was pushing
for that program was uh, a man that has, uh, was an ambassador at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and he was you know, basically disgraced because he, the, the project that he was pushing with the military didn't go anywhere. Paulo Nogueira Batista. Uh, he's, he was a, a rather brilliant intellectual, but uh, I don't know why he convinced himself wrongly that nuclear weapons were the only solution to the Brazilian problems at that time. By the end of my tenure at the, as rector of the University of Sao Paulo, he was disgraced uh, from the public service. And uh, it was suggested that he be invited to come to the Institute for Advanced Study as a sabbatical from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs for six months or a year to think and write if needed. And people were afraid that as a rector I would veto the invitation to Paulo Rogerbaches. I not only did not veto, but I encouraged that to happen because I think it was very important for the advancement of the understanding uh, of uh, what was happening in Brazil, the work of a person that really has uh, responsibilities in that area. And uh, I think that over the years, you know, many of these episodes took place and uh, I think the Institute for the Study became a sort of a heaven for people that want to get away from day-to-day -day lecturing or want to spend uh, sabbatical at the Institute. Some people take sabbaticals and they don't want to go abroad. And, uh, and uh, I think the Institute is very good for that. That's concluding. Uh, I think the Institute, uh, because that question was asked too, the Institute should not have permanent people. People should not be there for life. You know, I, I know the Institute for Advanced Studies at Princeton is different, but the, in the original conception of our Institute, the idea is that people would come for a period and then go. Because I don't think the Institute should be a replacement for people that are unhappy in their departments and come to the Institute for Advanced Studies to uh, protect themselves from the uh, obnoxious uh, head of department or whatever. You know, so uh, it's no substitute for the problems of the university. The university has to solve these problems at the department level. Uh, the institute is, uh, is uh, not uh, geared for that. So uh, basically, that's my uh, response to the tough questions that you made. Thank you very much. Thank you so much to Professor Goldenberg. I am uh, a witness that uh, the period that he was the rector, 86 to 90, was a transformative period in the University of São Paulo for many reasons and one of the reasons uh, obviously was the creation of the institute, but, but there are many, many, many other contributions and that period is fondly remembered. It was not an easy period because as you see, Professor Goldenberghi is a person that challenges. He is not uh, soft in the sense that everything is nice. He, he wants things to move uh, and to move uh, in the right way and uh, whatever needs to be done should be done. So thank you very much, Professor Godenbergi, uh, for opening this space in your agenda and for sharing with us uh, this part of the history. Uh, uh, we are uh, taping uh, this morning session. The other, other days are closed, but the taping and also transmitting uh, through internet. So I think these words uh, uh, are part of the history of the university and the history of the UBIAS collective uh, uh, network of uh, advanced studies uh, institutes. Uh, as uh, the next speaker, I invite Paulo Saljiva, who uh, has uh, the responsibility of uh, taking what uh, all our predecessors, predecessors 
uh, had to do, beginning with Professor Carlos Guilherme Mota, as mentioned, and uh, Professor Paulo will address uh, about the current uh, understanding of uh, what we are, what we are doing, for what purpose, and uh, uh, as Paulo is coming, may I just uh, highlight the presence of some dear colleagues here, uh, Professor Luis de Vilacqua. Professor Luis de Vilacqua is one of his visiting professors, fellows, and by the way, Professor Rodolfo mentioned that part of his music, Professor Rodolfo is an engineer, so all of what he does is equations, and part of the equations which have to do with fractals in the music were uh, provided by Professor Luis de Vilacqua who is sitting there and will accompany us. Also, Professor Alberto Pfeiffer, who is going to be on Thursday afternoon in the session which deals exactly with what Professor Goldenberg mentioned, uh, the Institute of Advanced Studies and Societies uh, is joining us now also to, to get together. So thank you very much for you uh, to be here with us all, please. Well, I have to explain uh, something that's very difficult to explain, how every institute has its, its own characteristics, it, the, its own complexity. But I think I can resume the, our institute in terms of how it functions uh, and which are the main topics that are planning to develop. As Professor Goldenberg said, uh, our institute takes advantage of not having a single permanent professor. This is a avoid some allergies of generated by continuous uh, contacts and also uh, takes out the, the feeling of possession that we at the university, we think that you are owners of some space or some area or some knowledge. So uh, this is good because uh, the, uh, I think that many of you that have also formal appointment at the university, there are some meetings that you get you get out worse than you entered. So I think there's some kind of neuronal destruction in some universities, university meetings. But in the, in the case of the Institute of Advanced Studies, it's quite rewarding and you get out better than you entered. So it's a marked improvement. And the second topic is that we are benefited by uh, the predecessors, my predecessors, with a group of uh, uh, supportive, uh, a support team of high quality, motivated, proud to be part of our institute. We uh, also have an enormous benefit of not being trapped by university bureaucracy. As universities grow, uh, it becomes a, a place uh, dominated by bureaucracy and the foe is to say no, it's not possible. And uh, when you have a very uh, small bureaucracy, the, the foe, yes, this can be done or at least it's worse to try. Uh, another thing that's important in our institute that we can uh, invite people from any university is a stupidity detector. Uh, uh, they have installed this when I saw it. Not, so the, it warns me that I'm getting out of the script. Uh, uh, it's very advanced. Uh, we tested in our, in our Congress and it, it didn't work. It was, was overloaded. But anyways, uh, the idea is that you can, uh, I always do a joke that NASA launched a satellite to capture evidence of intelligent life 
outside Earth. And, and when the satellite was over Brazil, it detected very strong signals of, of intelligent life, life outside our university. This was a, a, a very shocking information. And, and, and so, and, and in my case, in my office, there is a dark hole, uh, which is not very good for my, my self-esteem. But we can invite anybody, anybody, from the private sector, from with or without uh, a master or PhD degree, if it's necessary to compose or to produce a given group. So it's not, it's, it's like a just-in-time program. Whenever you need an external competency, you can aggregate it to our groups of study. Is, is, is it possible to, to evaluate, for instance, popular art or popular music without inviting musicians? And, or street artists or something. So I think this is quite unique in our university, especially at the medical school, where, from where I came from. Uh, uh, and indeed, my feeling is that when you enter in an institute like ours, and probably most, certainly yours, it's very difficult to return to the original place. You, you, you realize very rapidly the amount of energy and friction lost in, in producing only dissipation of heat in that or producing something useful. This flexibility imposes to us enormous responsibility because we not, cannot blame the bureaucracy or the structure by our own fault. So if it doesn't work, it's our fault. There is not, nothing impeding us to accomplish our task. And uh, so this is, was my first fear when I was appointed director of this institute. I can't blame anybody except myself for not making this to work. And also there is another characteristic that I noted in our notice in our institute. If I have to propose a material symbol of modernity, of the way of living nowadays is the selfie stick. We are always focusing on ourselves. We are, you are in a place and you have to, you are first, in a first position in respect to everything. You can see this at the streets, in the discussions, in the, in, in, in the buzz lines, but also in the university. All the mechanisms uh, of progression in the universities based on the grants and your publications and people that spend time taking or considering the possibility of addressing complexity, they change the length of the smartphone to the, not the, the selfie camera, but also to the surroundings. So we, you open your heart, you open your sensitivity, and, and open your mind. What you are doing and planning to do? First is a diagnosis of the challenges of a public university, especially in Latin America. How we can survive bureaucracy, how it can provide multidisciplinary research, but it's not keeping the disciplinary, multidisciplinary research or teaching or learning. I think learning is better than teaching, much better. Uh, uh, not restricted to our institute, but also we can, how we contaminate this outside. How we can take people from their comfort zone 
when you are got used to talk with your peers, uh, your your comrades and people that understand exactly what they are saying. How emerge in the danger of ignorance or to compl or or perhaps better complementarity. So your opinion can be modified by the opinion of others. And uh, it, this is vital for a university because if the, in the university you don't have debate, the university is dead. As a pathologist, I can assure you that I understand exactly the meaning of death. In fact, the mystery is not the death. I can sign a death certificate. But the mystery is life. I cannot sign a life certificate. But anyways, I think one of the most solid evidence of life is the capacity of mutual understanding, the capacity of looking for something different and also incorporating, interpreting the vast amount of knowledge that is now available in a single machine. The problem is not achieving knowledge, but interpreting. And interpreting means, means a comprehension. So if you don't comprehend the topic, you cannot interpret. You cannot make your own opinion. This group is vital for us. I don't know if we can uh, prevail, because the university has to change the paradigm. And sometimes the paradigm is changes when people die. And another generation came with uh, new views and new perspectives. The second topic is how to uh, how we transform our students into leaders, positive leaders. I think this. I I, I can say that Brazil is not very. Uh, good at this moment in, in, in forming leaders, but I think this is a, a, a world uh, challenge as well. How we can deal with differences and how you uh, balance your own stability with the stability uh, and how we deal with commodities and commons. I think this is a big challenge. Uh, how, how we establish an economy based on commons. We produce knowledge, we, we, we share our knowledge, but we still keep. How we evaluate this? How you promote equity at the same time you, can, you get funded you, as well? For instance, I have a personal opinion. Medical knowledge should be considered a common, not a commodity. But how we keep the things working, how we, we imagine a new economic system able to evaluate this. I think this is another challenge of our general topic in our institute. The third topic is how we deal with this biology of cities. Not urbanism, but biology of cities. Cities are living organisms. Uh, in Brazil, we, we experience a marked increase in a rapid urbanization. I can do the diagnosis of my city is an obese patient. So she, Sao Paulo grow more than the structure was able to support, has a severe atherosclerosis by uh, metallic thrombi with four wheels. We have diarrhea contaminating our water we have uh, renal insufficiency, so we cannot filter the water. We have autoimmune diseases because cells supposedly designed to defend the cells that we are parts of this organ, sometimes kill ourselves. We have a kind of, uh, I think, dementia. The directing neurons rapidly forget what they promise how we can solve the questions of urbanity, uh, the different cities uh, that are growing, uh, uh, decreasing the quality and retroceding in some aspects to medieval times, where you have new barons, new militia, and very 
poor, very low respect for the central authority. This is a lot. Uh, I, in, indeed, we have more refugees than Syria, but our refugees don't cross the Mediterranean because we are our internal refugees. How we deal with this question, how we recover our territory, how we provide ways of providing equity. Um, finally, we are addressing cross-border aspects. Uh, let me show an example. We had a musical experience. How our internal circuits respond to this? Probably if I have a holter in you, plug it in you, you decrease that the level of stress decreases, blood the pressure decreases. The, some inflammatory genes are have their expression decrease it. Some anti-inflammatory genes will secrete anti-inflammatory uh, proteins. So, what is the role of the humanity of arts and beauty into a university? How we defend this? What's the biology of aesthetics? Aesthetics is quite important. This is a very cheap watch. It costs one thousandth of a Rolex, but it's equally precise. When I bought this watch, the salesman said that I would dive, I, can, I, I could dive until 100 meters. I never get deeper than one meter, but he, <laughs> he, he told this four times. So for him, this was an important property. But the difference in price is aesthetic, is value, is symbolism. How we address this. So these main topics are spread in more than 20 research groups. And our challenge, even in our institute, how we make our groups to talk among themselves. We propose the multidisciplinarity, but are we are really motivating multidisciplinarity? The sabbatical professors that we received are doing a good job in unifying and linking the points, because if we lose control, our institute, designed to be multidisciplinary, would turn to be a confederation of small networks, how we link the points, are, are the occult properties of a system. So this is a very broad description of what, of what we are doing, what are uh, our challenges. I think we share many of the problems that you share in your institutions, and also we can, but we can present the, this group some peculiarities of Latin America. Uh, and perhaps this could foster collaboration among our institutions. And uh, again, the opportunity, it, it's very difficult and it's very uh, unusual for me to have intelligent people uh, hearing me with attention. Uh, at least in my, my home, I can say that uh, this with my sons, and uh, I, I, I am not very, uh, so it's not a usual situation for me, so I'm very proud because of it as well. Thank you very much for your patience. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, so thank you, Paulo. And now we'll have uh, three uh, uh, short testimonies, and uh, the first one is of Professor Massimo Canevacci. Uh, welcome back. Uh, in spite of having finished his term, he is always with us, so uh, you're welcome.
well, I will present my experience as a visiting professor here in the Institute of the Advanced Studies. Well, my experience is the following. I think that uh, the university system is in crisis uh, more or less all over the world. The traditional division of uh, discipline, faculty, department, uh, curriculum vitae uh, is not adequate to contemporary uh, challenge in my experience. And uh, the Institute of uh, Advanced Study, yeah, for me, it is an anticipation of the possible present future of the university based on undisciplinated perspective, undisciplinated, more than multidisciplinary. Every scholar, in my opinion, may affirm his or her own autonomous relation with other scholars beyond the disciplinary boundaries. My relation with the director, that time director, Martin Grossman, was for me exemplary. His formation on communication, art, museum, digital culture was favoring my project in my total autonomy. And my project was the following, this is the second point, self-representation. I am a cultural anthropologist. I discovered this concept, self-representation, on my ethnographic research in native culture in Mato Grosso, first Chavante and then the Bororo. Uh, Bororo culture just in the same village, Aldeia, where Levi-Strauss wrote his very famous book, uh, Triste Tropique. And I can say that the Bororo culture are not still triste or sad. Um, this kind of uh, research on self-representation, uh, uh, my principal uh, methodology was based in a transitive uh, between uh, the Aldeia and the metropolis, between Sao Paulo and Meruri. This kind of uh, multi-sided uh, ethnography is just my methodological and also political project. So, in this kind of uh, research, one uh, keyword was the ubiquity concept. Uh, ubiquity identities was changing the traditional kind of uh, subjectivity, both in the Bororo culture and in any urban context. So how we have to face this radical challenge, the ubiquity? It means that in the same time and space we have different kind of experience. It is going to change not only our experience, but also the way we are going to communicate and to realize a composition of our research. The other one concept was the first one was cultural syncretism and visual fetishism. <clears throat> My aim is to liberate syncretism and fetishism from the colonial and post-colonial tradition. I realized two, for me, important seminary in the yeah, in the institutes of uh, advanced studies. The first one was a very an emotional seminary. I invited two friends of mine from Bororo village, and the title was uh, Bororo Cosmology. And my point was that it, it was not myself or another anthropologist that I invited, but themselves, Kleber Meritororoi and Felix Adogrenau, who was speaking and interpreting their own cosmology. This for me is a very revolutionary moment. 
not only in anthropology, because native people have the power to represent themselves more than an anthropologist, a journalist, or a missionary. This is a very political change in my experience, and thanks to uh, the Institute. And uh, I can say that when uh, Kleber and Fex uh, uh, were talking and also singing uh, here, it was perhaps a milestone for me and also for humanities. The second seminary was about uh, um, time. I was presenting the concept of ubiquitime, uh, ubiquitime, just connecting ubiquitous and time, um, because um, I think that there is a, a possible relationship between ubiquities, ubiquity just like in every place, and utopia in no place. Where my question is just the following, which kind of relationship we could uh, um, face between these two contradictory concepts that are make a contemporary and simultaneous experience? Ubiquitous utopia. And then, uh, thanks to this kind of uh, um, invitation as a professor, visit, uh, visiting professor, I could, this is the fourth point, I did many conferences all over Brazil. I did conference in uh, Portugal, in Manchester, in the Congress of Anthropology, and in Italy. But the, the most important, and finally, the five point, the last point, is uh, my very accelerated uh, production of text, uh, books, and uh, essay. I can articulate it in two ways. The first one is uh, uh, The Line of Dust, uh, a book about uh, self-representation between uh, tradition, mutation, and Bororo culture. Uh, the Line of Dust was a very liminar and ritual moment of my life when I met for the first time a very special man, a very, very special man, uh, Mestre of Cantos, a master of chants in um, Meduri village. It was not easy to, not to talk, but to make experience with him. It was the great challenge of my ethnographic research and also my more emotional one. Well, the line of dust is a, an ethnographic research together with Bororo people. And recently was published in the same uh, editor, uh, uh, Sean Kingston Publisher, a British um, publisher a book on Lusophone hip-hop. Because the Lusophone culture in Brazil, Portugal, Cabo Verde, Mozambique, Angola, is a very, very important moment, a very international moment, less perhaps uh, known by, I don't know, perhaps yourself. Well, the way in this different kind they are making a new kind of pattern of hip-hop culture is very, very important. That's why for me, this kind of relationship between uh, the aldea, the line of dust, uh, and Bororo culture, and the communicational and performative metropolis uh, who is producing hip-hop culture is the focus of my multi-site ethnography. And the other one is uh, the relationship between uh, cultural syncretism and visual syncretism. In my opinion, I try to focus uh, um, another kind of concept. I decide to call it meta-fetishism. I try to elaborate a research on fetishism beyond any reification on alienation tradition. 
And uh, this is for me my contemporary research and uh, this kind of uh, partial books, as I say, are going to be published in, uh, in Italy, in Brazil, and in Spain, and only in the uh, United States. The final moment of my research in the year was the, per perhaps the most important uh, epistemological and political statement is the following. I think that uh, digital ubiquity in the Anthropocene is going to present the possibility of a non-anthropocentric anthropology. I mean that uh, the man is not the measure of all the culture. We have to change a paradigm, have you have to affirm a new kind of anthropology, anthropological cosmology, where anthropos, men and women, are not the center of the universe, the center of a culture. And I think that the digital culture in this moment are very, very important in this kind of direction. This is for me an astonishing facticity and the meta fetishist ethnography. Finally, uh, I was publishing some essay about uh, ubiquitous culture, ubiquitous syncretism, and so on. So it's a very important moment of my life. And uh, the way I was changing from my university in Rome, La Sapienza, to the institute here in San Paolo uh, was producing the, for me an accelerated moment of uh, knowledge, experience, and emotional statement. For all this reason, I have only to thank the IA for all my life through. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Massimo Canevacci. We also chose him because uh, it's an international experience. He comes from, as you uh, heard, he comes from another university and stayed here. So this uh, uh, brings us to our UBS network, the possibility and the benefits of exchanging uh, uh, places uh, and exchanging places, exchange also maybe the fate, the destiny. Uh, our second uh, short testimony is from Professor Ana Lidia Sawaya. Professor Ana Lidia Sawaya, she'll talk more about uh, what she did, but she is from uh, uh, another university in Sao Paulo, but from the Federal University of Sao Paulo, UNIFESPI, and she, uh, uh, differently from Professor Massimo, who was kind of uh, a fellow uh, with uh, basically uh, his uh, leading uh, uh, research, Professor Anna Lydia, she heads a research group which is very important, very productive, and thank you for coming. Good morning. I'm very glad to be here, and I thank Professor Saldiva and Professor Pongsi for the invitation. And I'm going to be very short. I will read, so I, I take my time <laughs> uh, in 10 minutes um, about what we do in our research group in IEA. Uh, the study and research group called Nutrition and Poverty started in 2003. It is amazing for us that we are still very active since then. We play with each other, often saying that we have been active and animated for so many years because the problems we discuss, as they continue to happen, do not let the ball fall, as the Brazilians say. The dynamic of the group 
is the promotion of discussions and analysis of national programs and policies concerning nutrition, especially addressed to those who live in poverty in Brazil. To achieve this goal, the group seeks to bring together scholars, government, and NGO experts to stimulate dialogue and integration between them. We conduct seminars, workshops, and talks with invited speakers regularly. In recent years, we have been holding semi-annual public events. One of the activities that we cherish very much and try to perform regularly are the publications for dissemination of the topics we discuss with the aim of sharing them with the academic community and above all, the society and the general public. We also care about giving visibility to the themes we discuss through dissemination of our events in the IEA media. The group has also been engaged in the publication of two books with a multidisciplinary approach. The main characteristic of the group, in fact, is that, uh, and that it makes the opportunity to work in the advanced studies in here at the USP so interesting, is the possibility of working with a multidisciplinary team, which is practically impossible in our academic unities. Another characteristic of our group that is worth mentioning is that this group was created also because an extension project that I was involved for many years in my original university. I'm also from USP, but now I'm working in the Federal University of Sao Paulo. Almost 30 years ago, we have created the Center for Education and Recovery of Malnourished Children called CRANE. CRANE offers outpatient assistance to children and adolescents with mild undernutrition or obesity. We treat around 7,000 uh, children and adolescents per year. And at their hospital care for those exhibiting moderate to severe undernutrition. And in this case, we have around 140 kids per year. Crane is now, uh, it was extracted from the university administration and is now an NGO, very close and linked officially to the university, but administratively speaking is separate. And it works in a network with the state's health system, primary health care units, and hospitals. More than four million people were benefit over this time. The type of treatment includes nutritional education, improving the quantity and quality of food consumption, social support for the families, including regular home visits, associated medical follow-ups, and psychological counseling. Pediatricians, dietitians, social workers, psychologists, and teachers participate in the treatment, which targets the recovery of height and weight. Together with this work of assistance and outpatient clinic or the hospital, we also do research. And the spirit of this research is a multidisciplinary approach. Uh, now, to, f to finish, to give a better example of our activities and the subjects which are, uh, we are interested in in our group now uh, at the moment, I would like to share two issues that we are currently discussing. The first one is about violence. We have had two seminars and one invited speaker last year to talk about the increasing violence in slums and how the situation is harming home health care in Brazil and aggravating nutritional problems. 
slums emerged in the hills of Rio de Janeiro in the early 20th century and were built by former slaves. You might know that Brazil has, the, has had the largest and the longest slavery trade in the world. Um, some people say that around six million uh, Africans were brought to Brazil over almost two, 300 years. Uh, in the last decades, the speed of their growth has intensified. Between 2000 and 2010, the growth of slums was 12 times higher than the annual increase of Brazilian households. The number of people living in these conditions, 61% Afro-Brazilians, increased from 6.5 million to more than 14 million in 2010. São Paulo, although it's the richest city in Brazil, houses 27% of all the slums in the country. Their inhabitants came originally from the northern part of the country. Professor Saldiva mentioned the internal refugees. Uh, since the 2000s, these communities have been occupied by poor workers, 65% of them with a work permit, but not capable to pay income, to have enough income to pay their rent. Approximately 2 million people reside in the slums of Sao Paulo nowadays. These territories have the highest prevalence of undernutrition among children caused by unhealthy housing. These areas also have the highest prevalence of adult obesity caused by the consumption of low-cost ultra-processed foods associated with a greater susceptibility to gaining weight. Especially women who suffered undernutrition in early life. Stunting in children under five years of age is between six to eight percent in Brazil, but exceeds a staggering 25 percent in high vulnerability groups. Coexistence of these two diseases represents a double burden for health intervention and greatly increases the cost of implementing public policies. Increasingly, organized gangs like the First Capital Command, you might have heard of, PCC, have extended their territorial dominance from prisons to almost all Brazilian slums. The PCC now dominates the wholesale drug distribution market and is ex extending its organizational structure outside Brazil. There is increasing evidence that those who remain in slums over second and third generation can enter a download spiral of ill health and poverty which is progressively more difficult to escape. Increasing violence has added to the challenges of implementing universal health care, one of the goals of the state unified health system called SUS in Brazil. Poverty used to be, perhaps, the principal malaise of emerging countries. Today, drug trafficking, violence and accidents are at the root of social inequity. The second subject that we have been discussing, you, you understand that this is big enough and complicated enough, so <laughs> we've been dealing with this uh, for more than a year now. The second subject that we have been discussing in the last years is the increasing prevalence of obesity among school children 
related to the quality of the food offered by the school. In addition to this, we started investigating the increasing prevalence of food addiction among them. This is occurring because the techniques of production and especially sailing used by food industry induce eating disorders generating obesity and chronic diseases. Drinks and foods, especially those high in salt, fat and sugar, activate macronutrient activate neurotransmitters through this the intake of these nutrients that control the state of pleasure and create conditional reflexes associated with dependence. Unfortunately, Brazil is one of the most important markets for transnational industries to sell ultra-processed foods. The powerful lobby of these big industries directly at the federal government level has prevented regulation for production and advertising of these ultra-processed products up to now. To give you an example, US and Europe have a much more strict regulation for these products than Brazil. Many transnational industries have increased their selling of these products here at the same time as their production has decreased in US and Europe. I finish now. Well, I think you now have an idea of what we are discussing and on why we keep so much motivated. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Ana Lidia. Um, on, at the same time that she presented the dynamic of a uh, research group, she opened uh, to you uh, the fact that uh, we are in a country of contrasts. That's a characteristic of uh, this part of the world, and uh, obviously this makes the Institute also uh, have an agenda which uh, has to be sensitive to the environment. That Paolo already presented. It helps also to understand yesterday's uh, explanation of Louise uh, uh, Malatesta, the curator of the Tomiotaki Institute, when she explained the part of the exhibits that we were able to see yesterday, especially of that third room, uh, the angel uh, 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 room uh, describing exactly the issues uh, of trade slave and the consequences until today. Uh, the last uh, uh, testimony is of uh, dear friend Professor Eugenio Bucci. Professor Eugenio Bucci, he'll talk about uh, himself a bit more uh, in between, but basically uh, he is in uh, uh, a very known personality in Brazil, a member of our university, but very known personality in the area of journalism. And uh, he, uh, besides everything, uh, uh, has been part of our institute as member of the board. He finished and uh, currently he is member of the board of the Institute of, of Advanced Studies, uh, re-emerged in univers at University of Campinas. Thank you very much for coming and thank you for I'm sorry that you had to finish your class a few minutes before in order to be with us. Thank you, Professor Polonsky. Good morning, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. I, I also took some notes to speak more easier for you. Uh, and I'll tell you a little story, a short story about communication and communication inside our Institute of Advanced Studies. 
First of all, I would like to say that it's been for me a tremendous experience being part of this institute. It's very, it's very special for me. And I'll tell you the story. About 10 years ago, I was joined as faculty at the School of Communication, Communications and Arts. Uh, later, I was invited to be uh, a research professor um, at the Institute of Advanced Studies. And after that, I became a member of the board of this institute and our deliberative council. And then I started a research group called Journalism, Law, and Freedom. We are particularly interested in freedom of expression in general and also in, in information in contemporary society. During this time, I realized how crucial is the Institute of Advanced Studies in order to keep our university up to date, I would say. Our institute has been a center of influence for the interdisciplinarity and the ability to reinvent models of the university and for the university in a time that we need to cross the borders. We need to cross the thresholds of knowledge and especially we need to overcome the limits of each isolated expertise, each isolated field of knowledge. Our institute is particularly devoted, devoted to make easier internal communications inside USP. And this is my point here. In the other hand, our institute is also important to improve in quality and understand the relationship between University of Sao Paulo and society. And then I would tell you a little story about this, a story that is very special for me. Instead, it seems to be a small story but it's plenty of significance. It's very strong, this story for us. For three years, I was in charge of the whole system, the whole service of social communications at USP, which means, among other channels, I was responsible for Radio USP, USP Radio, one of the most fascinating public radios in Brazil. Two years ago, we launched a new program, a small program, a news program, a daily program in the radio uh, that was possible just because we have a partnership between USP Radio and our Institute of Advanced Studies. Our medical school came together to make uh, this effort possible. This achievement, and it's a very special achievement for us, only was possible because of this cooperation. It's, I repeat, it's a small story, it's a small case, but it's a story that reflects the vocation of our institute to make the relationship between USP 
and the society better than it was. Since December, I am a member of the Scientific and Cultural Council of the Institute of the Advanced Studies at UNICAMP, as Professor uh, Ari Plonsky already said. And I am facing a new time in this Institutes of Advanced Studies. We have a third, a third public university in Sao Paulo, which is UNESP, and UNESP, USP, and UNICAMP, with their Institute of Advanced Studies, are working together in some new projects. And this project has also to do with communication. To close my words here, I would say that Institute of Advanced Studies is building new platforms of dialogues with both philosophy and sciences outside and inside university. That's why we are here today. And that's why we are all, all committed in planning a future based in knowledge and in a culture of peace. That's why USP warmly welcome you all. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor. Well, uh, thank you, Professor Eugenio Bucci, who uh, I believe uh, uh, combines uh, the idea that uh, uh, first we have obviously to develop new ideas, but we have also to take much care of how we communicate in order to make them uh, uh, more uh, recognizable and relevant. Uh, with this, we finish the second part of the morning. Uh, the idea was to open our house, uh, physically you'll see it afternoon, but to open our, our house uh, totally to you, uh, how we operate, uh, why we were created, uh, what are we doing now, how we operate, how the people, or some people at least, who give us the pleasure of uh, being at the Institute feel the possibility of having, an, an, as the title of the session said, an environment for dialogue between sciences and with society. It's important, between sciences and with society. We don't put a period after dialogue between sciences. For the reasons, all the reasons that you heard, the second part is exactly as important as the first. And uh, as Paulo said, the, the uh, uh, responsibility that we have is on both sides to enhance the dialogue among sciences, but also with society. Uh, so thank you very much. Professor Goldenberg had to leave a few minutes before. Uh, Paulo Saldiva, uh, Massimo Canevacci, Ana Lidia Sawaya, and Eugenio Bucci for uh, helping you to understand us a bit better. Let me tell you what's going to happen uh, from now until we resume activities afternoon. Uh, in a two, three minutes, we are going to leave this room and we are going out uh, to the lobby of the building. And at the lobby of the building, uh, Renata Costa will wait for us for a five, ten minute uh, presentation of some uh, small exhi uh, exhib exhibition that is in the, on the side of the lobby in this building, which uh, uh, has to do with something very symbolic for Brazil, that is the Paulista Museum. Paulista is the name uh, of somebody who was born in the state of São Paulo. Uh, São Paulo was the seat of the 1822 Declaration of Independence, the city of São Paulo, and uh, later a museum was created, firstly called Museu da Independence Museum and then Paulista Museum. Uh, and uh, this museum belongs uh, to, the, to the university. This museum, uh, with the time, had, uh, it's a very special place, uh, had several physical problems in the building, and the museum is closed, but there is a project 
to reopen it in a total different and modern uh, way, advanced, if I can say way, in, uh, before 2022, when th there will be 200 years of the independence. And Renata, who is uh, very active in uh, this uh, project, uh, will, uh, with the help of what is there in a few minutes, as I mentioned, explain. So you al also have an experience of the history of Brazil and how uh, 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 this history is memorialized and how this memorialization is transformed. Uh, so from there, from uh, after this uh, brief uh, visit to the, this gallery on the lobby of this building, we'll walk uh, more or less together uh, to the restaurant called Sweden, and Portuguese people say Sweden which is a restaurant of the business school, is some, uh, depending on, on, on the pace, seven, eight, nine minutes distance, the weather is nice, and we'll go to the second floor, on the second floor, when you come out, you'll go, we'll go to the right and to the end room, where you'll see tables uh, with signs reserved IEA, IEA in Portuguese, for our institute. It is a, self-serving uh, buffet with much uh, variety. Uh, yesterday we had two, uh, three, sorry, uh, quote-unquote guinea pigs, uh, Bern, Morton and, and Lena, and they not only survived, but they seem also to be happy. So, uh, so we will have uh, the opportunity to uh, to serve yourself. We know of some people who have special needs for for the food, uh, no, um, anyhow, uh, uh, gluten or whatever. So if somebody didn't announce, please uh, approach me and we'll take care that this special need will be uh, looked into. Uh, so uh, from there, uh, let me just see the time. Uh, around, uh, we'll be one hour there for lunch. It's more than enough because the food is ready. So around 1.15, more or less, uh, we'll go down and we'll have vans waiting to bring us to the Institute of Advanced Studies. And all our sessions from afternoon to Thursday evening will be at the Institute. And uh, we'll have the opportunity to uh, show you, present you something of the Institute physically. I mean, you'll be there, but uh, two, three minutes just to see what... Uh, the surroundings are. So basically, to, to uh, uh, sum uh, up uh, from here, please wait in the lobby of the building. You'll see to the left as you leave, just after the turnpike, you'll, it's not really the turnpike, but after the barrier, which is kind of half open, you'll see to the left a small gallery. Please, uh, you can go into the small gallery. Renata will talk to us from there. We'll walk more or less together to the business school restaurant on the second floor and uh, we'll have lunch. Bon appétit. Uh, we heard about nutrition from Professor Anna Lydia, so please uh, uh, eat well, think about obesity, and uh, again, thank you for your patience and uh, we hope that we could express ourselves. My last sentence is that, of what I understand from Ubias, if you know one institute, you know one institute. So each institute has its own characteristics, and we thought it was worthwhile to use half of the morning to present the characteristic of this institute, which is not better, not worse, but different from all others, at the same time, part of the same network. Thank you so much.